grew up with, a, the atom is a little solar system, gave us a rather skewed image or idea of what an atom actually is. Uh, one thing that we did learn from that solar system model, uh, albeit not perhaps to scale, is that atoms are mostly made up of space. I remember even at the time being really fascinated that, by the idea that something that felt solid to me, something like a table or this podium, was actually mostly made up of space and what that even meant. So today we know that atoms are really not like miniature solar systems. Uh, in fact, if we think about it in terms of a particle in terms of field theory, we can say that an electron is really an excitation of energy in a spread out electron field. It is a quanta, or a little packet of energy in that field. The physicist Richard Feynman explains, this is a quote, things on a very small scale behave like nothing you have any direct experience about. They do not behave like waves, they do not behave like particles, they do not behave like clouds or billiard balls or weights on springs or like anything we have ever seen. So we use these words, all of our words are analogous when we're talking about things this small. Um, our words become more like poetry. Mathematics is the language of science. And so what we do is we try to translate mathematics into words. So we say matter is space and energy. We say that matter is particle and wave. One of the things that first sparked my interest in science is the complementarity of particle and wave through a famous experiment usually referred to as the double slit experiment. And I, I'm actually not going to go into detail about this experiment, though it's very fascinating, and if you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend looking it up. But in short, what they learned from doing this experiment is that when you set the experiment up asking a particle question, you will get a particle answer. When you set the experiment up asking a wave question, you will get a wave answer. And it depends on our means of measurement. We also learned that we don't know, or that we can't know, where a particle is, where it's located, until we measure it. We can predict the probability that it will be in a certain place, but we cannot know with certainty until we measure it. That idea of not being able to know the exact position or location of an electron and at the same time the exact velocity or momentum of an electron is called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So the more that we know about a particle's position, the less certain we become about its wavelength or momentum and vice versa. In a concept known as superposition, we say that the particle is spread out as a wave of all possible positions until we measure it or observe it. Once we measure it or observe it, it is only in one position. When we say that superposition means that the particle exists in a wave of possible places, the wave function we're talking about is a wave of probability, which tells us that the particle is more likely to be found in some positions than others. And mathematically, your most extreme positions actually cancel each other out. One important thing to remember about quantum physics, particularly when we're putting it into conversation with religion, is that we do not notice these effects in what we might call the macro world. Quantum laws only apply to things that are smaller than Planck's con constant. So you see in this uh, cartoon I have there, they're talking about quantum teleportation. And uh, the man says, like, I'm sick of a reporter. Every time there's a paper on quantum teleportation, you, you know, reporters tell the same story. And he says, I'm going to go to the Bahamas. You notice he clicks it to regular teleportation. In other words, you couldn't get there through quantum teleportation because we don't exist on a quantum level. We exist on a macro level. Um, so, so we have to remember that quantum laws only apply to things that are smaller than Planck's constant. You and I, were not smaller than Planck's constant. Um, so we talk about superposition. I can't be in multiple positions at one time because I exist on the macro level. 
Another important issue in talking about quantum mechanics is to know that there are different interpretations for the same data. And there's no conclusive proof of which interpretation is correct. So we're always often talking about a certain school of interpretation. The Copenhagen School holds that one cannot know the position of and the momentum of a particle. All that we can know is the probability of where we might find that electron. This school does not really concern itself with where the electron really is, because they would say you cannot know that. We are incapable of knowing where the electron is uh, prior to measurement. Another school of interpretation, the hidden variables school, suggests that the wave is real, but that it's hidden. Uh, in the hidden variables school, the understanding would be that the particle is being guided by a real wave. We just have not yet discovered the means of observing or measuring that wave. Another theory says that the particle exists in every possible position in multiple worlds or different worlds. So one of the big questions that when we look at the paradigm shift of quantum physics between a Newtonian worldview and a quantum worldview is one of, and these are fancy words that mean something relatively simple, epistemology versus ontology. What we know versus what exists. So uh, is it simply that we don't know where the particle is? In other words, the limitation is on our side. The limitation is on what I know. The, the, the particle really does, or the, you know, for in the electron example, the electron really exists in a specific position before we measure it. We simply don't know what that position is, and we don't yet have a way to determine what that position is. But eventually, if science advances, we'll be able to do so. That would be the Newtonian worldview. It's also partially the perspective between, behind the hidden variables interpretation and what Einstein actually believed would be the case. Or is it that not that we just don't know where the particle is, is it that we cannot know where the particle is? In other words, the particle does not exist in any particular place until it is measured or observed. The issue here is not epistemological. It's not about what we know or what we don't know. It's ontological. It's about what exists or doesn't exist. Uh, superposition tells us that the electron is both everywhere and nowhere until we measure it. And that until we make that measurement, there only exists the probability of it being in a definite position. So these two positions can be sort of summed up by a famous exchange between Einstein and Bohr in which Einstein proclaimed God does not play dice with the universe and Bohr responded Einstein stop telling God what to do. Einstein argued that following quantum theory to its logical conclusion would create what he called spooky action at a distance, a phenomenon that came to be known as entanglement. The key point to understanding entanglement is to understand that the entangled particles act as a single system. They act as one whole rather than acting as separate individuals. So you see this sort of uh, cartoon explanation here. The, the photons in this example uh, are entangled. One is sent to Alice and one is sent to Bob. Alice and Bob are very distant from one another. So the photons are very distant from one another, but they remain entangled. Alice randomly chooses to measure the, the polarization of her photon, and she doesn't tell Bob. Bob also randomly chooses a way to measure the polarization of his photon, and he doesn't tell Alice. But they realize the results of their measurements are correlated because the photons are entangled. They act as a single system, even though they're miles apart. Uh, the main issue that comes up in entanglement is causality. Up until quantum theory, the world had been understood through local causality. We're familiar with this in the notion of cause and effect. If I push a ball, the ball rolls. I cause the roll, ball to roll by pushing it. 
you can add in gravity and friction and all of these other laws, but there's, there's a cause, me pushing the ball, and there's an effect, the ball rolls. We also see this in, in terms of fields. So many of us may be familiar with magnetic, magnetic fields. Uh, in that case, it's not that the objects aren't, so, so I, I like to do this with my son. My son is four, and he's got one of these little magnetic train sets, and if I turn one of the trains around, I can make the other train move without ever touching it. So you would say, well, that's not local causality because they're not touching each other. But it is local causality because while the two trains are not touched, the two cars of the train are not touching each other, the magnetic field that is created is, is touching the other train. So the train is still being moved by local causality. Does that make sense? You following that example? Kind of? Um, okay, so that's local ca causality, cause and effect. Entangled particles demonstrate what scientists call non-local causality. The particles are not touching in any way, and they are further apart than it is possible to communicate because even information cannot travel faster than the speed of light. Yet when we observe the position, velocity, or spin of one particle, we know that the entangled particle, we know that of the entangled particle, no matter how much distance is between them. Theoretically, they could be on opposite ends of the universe, and we would still instantaneously know the measurement of one when we measured the other. Um, Einstein thought that this experiment that he proposed demonstrated that the electron must have a definite position prior to being measured. Brian Greene explains this, and, and Brian Greene is a great author. There's a bibliography on the back of your handout. Brian Greene is a great author if you're not a science person. I'm not, I don't have a background in science, and Brian Greene breaks things down and explains it to people like me that don't have a great science background. And he uses the example of a pair of gloves. So from Einstein's perspective, if I get to work in Chicago, and it's winter time, and I reach into my pocket as I'm getting out of my car because I'm going to put my gloves on, and I pull out my left glove, and my right glove is not there, I know before going home that it will be my right glove that I find on the floor of my garage or on the floor in my hallway. Uh, there's no quantum mystery there. It didn't become my right glove when I pulled the left glove out of my pocket. It was always my right glove, just as my left glove was always in my pocket. It was simply that I didn't know it, epistemology. It had to do with what I knew or didn't know. Einstein's thought experiment suggested that the entangled particles already had definite correlated positions, but that we're simply ignorant of those positions until we measure them. As time passed, however, it became possible to test Einstein's theory, and scientists discovered that Einstein was wrong. The entangled electrons were not like my pair of gloves. The physicist John Pokinghorn explains this using the image of balls in an urn. He said that for Einstein, he thought it would be, if I had an urn with two balls in it, it would be as if there was a white ball and a black ball in the urn. If I pull out the white ball, I know that you're going to pull out the black ball. Again, the balls don't change, our knowledge changed. If I pull out the black ball, I know that you're going to pull out the white ball. When scientists did the experiments using the spin of electrons, however, the results are truly random. There's no way to predict the spin of the electron. So Pokinghorn suggests in the urn example, it would be a, as if there were two balls in the urn, and if I pull out the red ball, it, you will pull out the blue ball. But if you pull out the green ball, I will pull out the yellow ball. And the balls have no color prior to being pulled out of the urn. At this point, I would remind you that Richard Feynman famous, famously said, I don't think that anyone really understands quantum physics. So if you're feeling a little confused, you're in good company. The, physis the physicist Anton Z uh, Zeilinger gives us an, another example, and he in his example uses imaginary quantum dice. He says, imagine there was a pair of dice. Now if you know anything about rolling dice, rolling dice is, is random. You can predict a certain probability 
uh, but you cannot predict with any certainty what number you're going to roll on a die. Imagine there was a pair of dice that was this quantum pair of dice where we each had one, and no matter where we went in the universe, the first time we rolled our respective dice, they would always show the same number. We had no way of knowing what number it was that was gonna be rolled. That would be random. But we would know that the two would always land on the same number. Each die has a random roll, yet the number rolled on each would be the same. Einstein wanted to say that the dice were loaded, that it was predetermined which number they would show. Zeilinger asks, how can two random events give the same result without there being any connection between them? The answers are not predetermined and they don't communicate with one another. Rather, the two electrons act as a single system. The result is random, but the two electrons act as one. So like our imaginary quantum dice, we, can, we could not predict with certainty uh, what the dice are gonna show, but we can predict with certainty that the two dice will show the same number. As a side note, when you're talking about spin with electrons, they actually don't show the same, they show the opposite but that's, that's just a detail for those of you who are more familiar with the science. Um, so what is real is not so much the individual particles by themselves, but the relationship that is between them. One more piece of the science I wanna give you, which, which I just find uh, fascinating, and, and a physicist whose work I really have been intrigued by is Lee Smolin. Now Lee Smolin works in loop quantum gravity. So if any of you watch Big Bang Theory, you might be uh, familiar with a little bit of the conflict between loop quantum gravity and string theory. Uh, we're not gonna get into that today, but this work that he's done has led him to do a lot of work with the concepts of time and space. And Smolin's work has led him to suggest the priority of relationship and interconnection in reality. Reality is all about relationship. To show what he means by the priority of relationship, he gives the example of the difference between a sentence and a list of words. It's the relationship between the words that makes the meaning of the sentence. Without the relationship between the words, you would just have a list of words. So what makes a sentence a sentence is the relationship between the words. Space, Smolin suggests, is the relationship between objects. Therefore, re what reality is, reality is the network of relationships between objects or among objects. And he even more accurately would call an object an event because there's, he would say, every object is an event. Every object experiences its progression through time. And so then time is the way that we measure change in those relationships. Both space and time, according to Smolin, emerge from relationship. Relationship is what is primary. In this system, Smolin goes on to explain, humans are stories. And again, he says the difference between a story and a list of events is the relationship and the connection between the events in the story. Our lives are created by the relationship between the events in our life. We who are, as or who we are as persons is created by the relationship between the events in our lives. And all of those relationships are interconnected. Our stories are interwoven with one another. My story does not exist without your story. From this moment on, our stories are entangled. Smolin states two quotes I wanna give you. He says, the universe of events is a relational universe. And again, he says, why it is, why there is something rather than nothing is probably not a question that has an answer. Save that, perhaps. To exist is to be in relation to other things that exist. 
And the universe is simply the set of all those relations. Let that, that sink in for just a second. OK, so what does all this mean? Well, let's start with what it doesn't mean. Uh, again, you, we're not talking here tonight about ESP or mind reading, other types of psychic or what, what we might call paranormal phenomenon. Planck's constant is an important principle to recall before we start trying to talk, use concepts from quantum physics as analogies when we're talking about the macro world. Planck's constant tells us that quantum theory only applies to that which is smaller than a Planck length. In other words, not you and me. The idea of entanglement, however, provides us with a brilliant metaphor for talking about our reality and the very real interconnectedness of everything that exists. And we learn from observing the created world that reality at its tiniest Planck levels images reality as we experience it in our lives in terms of the priority of relationship. Like entangled particles, I cannot have certainty about who I am, who you are, or who God is. But I can have certainty that we are in relationship with one another. In looking at the issues of ontology and epistemology, existence and knowledge, the physicist Anton Zeilinger associates being with being known, stating that being without being known makes no sense at all. To exist is to be known. One can also say that to be is to be loved, and that to be loved is to be. Being without being loved makes no sense at all. Being loved and loving is the so what of our existence. So now we're going to move out of science, and we're going to talk about the theological or the pastoral implications uh, some of the ways we might think about these concepts. Again, I'm using the concepts here as metaphors uh, or as analogies. You know, how can we take some of these really fascinating images that we get from the created world and then apply them to how we understand ourselves and our relationships? So, as early as his experience on the road to Damascus, Paul has an insight into reality. In the narrative version of the story that we find in Acts of the Apostles, Saul hears a voice. And what does that voice say, if you remember? The voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? His insight that that story is telling us about, his insight is that the community is the body of Christ. We who are many are one. We who share one bread become one body. We are all parts of the same body, but it's more than just being part of one whole. It's more than being part of the same community, as if we're simply the sum of our parts. Paul says, the others are part of me, and I am part of them. We are all part of one another. When one suffers, we all suffer. When one is honored, we all share the joy. Your sorrow is my sorrow. Your joy is my joy. We are entangled. We, you're, you are part of my reality, and I am part of yours. Like entangled particles, we're all part of an undivided whole. The body of Christ is a single entity. Like particles, we seem to be individual, but in reality, we are part of one system. We are no longer Greek or Jew, slave or free, woman or man, but Christ is all and in all. So for Paul, the main ethical criterion that he uses becomes the community, the body of Christ. The law becomes judged by the community rather than the community being judged by the law. So if you are Jewish and you follow the purity laws, Paul says, fine, that's fine, go ahead, follow the purity laws. Unless that means that you can't sit down at a meal next to your Gentile brother or sister. Paul says, if you're Gentile and you want to eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols and you don't really believe the idols are real, so you don't think it matters, 
He says, that's fine, go ahead. It doesn't mean anything, unless it means that you are scandalizing your Jewish brothers and sisters. He says, if you are wealthy, and you eat and you get drunk without being mindful of the poor who are among you, you eat and drink judgment on yourself because you do not recognize your own body. He's saying you do not recognize in doing that act, in that act where you're caught up in your own world and not seeing those among you who are poor and who are being neglected. He says you do not recognize those who are a part of you, those of whom you are a part. We all belong to one body, what Augustine calls the totus Christus, the total Christ made up of Jesus the head and of all the members of the body. That body of Christ, that interconnection of each of us to one another and to Jesus who is the head is called then to be the ongoing incarnation in the world. The body of Christ is called to be the sacrament of God's love and God's mercy in the world. So one immediate question that arises when we start talking about the body of Christ is, is this body inclusive or is it exclusive? Are we talking about only the baptized? Are we talking about only humanity? Or are we talking about all of creation? I would suggest that in this image, in this metaphor, any exclusion is problematic. Any exclusion is problematic when we're talking about a creation whose core reality is entanglement. As Paul points out, creation itself groans in labor pains and waits in eager expectation and will share in the freedom and the redemption of the children of God. I'm just going to get rid of these little virus definition things. I don't know how to get rid of that one. Okay. Um, so incarnation, when we talk about incarnation, uh, incarnation in the person of Jesus Christ is the unity of God and matter itself. Matter as energy and relationship, and in this incarnation, God is intricately interconnected with all things that exist. There are obviously implications for this point in terms of our relationship to creation itself, as Pope Francis highlights in uh, Laudato Si, and you could have a whole talk just on that. We're actually gonna stick with talking about humanity, the interconnectedness of humanity, and our relationships to one another, both within our communities and to those outside of our communities. So as a community, we have to ask ourselves, whose voices do we not hear? Who are those who are at the margins of our communities? As they are part of the body of Christ, we cannot know Christ without knowing those people. We cannot know Christ without learning their stories. They're part of our reality and they can teach us things that we cannot learn from our own experience. So within our communities, we are called to greater inclusivity and to greater listening. We also need to think about inclusivity in terms of those who are outside of our own religious traditions. So again, the incarnation was not the union of God and Christians. The incarnation is the union of God and humanity, all humanity, and even all creation. So we have to also understand ourselves to be entangled with all humanity. Stephen Edmondson is an Episcopalian minister and he began this open communion movement at his parish. So in his parish, all are called to the table. Everyone, anyone who walks through his doors are called to the communion table. Not just Christians, but all people, regardless of, not, of whether or not they're baptized. His parish is in an urban area where there are many poor and homeless and people often wander into the parish off the streets. And when they do, they are welcomed to the table, no questions asked. 
He notes, Jesus did not require people to be baptized before he sat down at table with them. And as one of his parishioners stated, we need to recognize that some cannot be more children of God than others. God does not love us because we are Christian. We are a Christian as a way of responding to God's love. The message of our entanglement as the body of Christ is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The parts do not exist outside of the whole. However, as the physicist David Bohm, now as a little caveat here, David Bohm is actually from the hidden variables school, not the Copenhagen interpretation, so it's a slightly different slant on the whole interpretation of quantum physics. But he raises some really interesting and important points, and that is that we live in a world of fragmentation. We tend to understand things by breaking them down into smaller parts. It's one of the ways that our minds work, how we figure things out. We figure things out by dividing, by separating, by fragmenting. And that's not a bad thing per se, uh, but it can be bad if it becomes our only way of understanding or our primary way of understanding things. It can be bad when we start to divide humanity along ethnic, racial, nationalistic, or class lines. These divisions create a social sin that goes beyond our individual or personal sin. And at the same time, we also recognize that our personal sin affects the whole. It sustains social and systemic sin. If I am not being my best self, I am denying something to the whole. My freedom impacts your freedom. Freedom is actually not unlimited in part because we are interconnected. Like entangled particles, you cannot predict what my actions will be and I cannot predict what your actions will be, but we can predict with certainty that on some level, we will be affected by one another's actions. We have freedom, but our freedom is entangled. We hear a lot in recent years about the Google bubble, uh, this idea that we can isolate ourselves intentionally or unintentionally, so that we only hear and see the things that reinforce our own beliefs. We cannot learn from another's story, from another's perspective, if we isolate ourselves from one another, if we try to act like individual particles instead of a, a system, instead of a whole. One of the problems with isolating ourselves is isolation also reinforces what we call implicit bias. Uh, we internalize this fragmentation in our society. We internalize it in ways that we are not even conscious of, creating an us and them mentality, creating the other as other in an act that we can call othering the other. We, other, we, we separate, we fragment, we divide. As an example of implicit bias, uh, to use an issue that's actually been in the news a lot recently, studies have shown that people in the US culture see black males as bigger and stronger and more dangerous than their white counterparts, even when there's no difference. So studies have shown you can take a white man and a black man who are the same height and the same weight. And when people have been asked to evaluate it, they think that the person who's black is taller and they think that he's bigger. Uh, that's implicit bias. People don't know that they're doing it. They're not doing it on purpose. This implicit bias can also mean that a biochemical response of fight or flight is triggered in people's brains when they encounter uh, a black man. This can be true for police officers as well. And it's not, the studies have shown that it's not only true for white police officers, it's also true for black police officers. Again, these biases are implicit. They are not explicit. Uh, it does not mean that a person is consciously racist, though some people are. That's not what this is saying. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about something that's implicit, that's going on without people's conscious awareness. Um, 
What that means is that we cannot address the issue of race in our country without understanding that we are interconnected parts of a whole. When we focus on individuals rather than the whole, we ignore these concepts of implicit bias and social sin. The headlines of our papers over the past several years have tragically illustrated this issue of looking at society as if we are each individuals separately interacting with one another instead of being more like electrons that can't be understood apart from the system to which they belong. So, for example, while much is made of individuals and the particular circumstances for each police shooting of a black person, the Black Lives Matter movement has challenged us to step back and look at the system and the pattern that emerges when one looks at the whole rather than looking at individual cases. To say that Black Lives Matter is not to say that all lives don't matter. Of course they do. It's to say that one part of the body is in pain and it needs the attention of the whole body. It is to say that the whole body is not functioning because the body is suffering from the disease of racism. That disease does not just impact persons of color. It impacts the whole body. You would not look at a gaping wound in your leg and simply say, my, that's horrible, and then go about your business. You also wouldn't look at a gaping wound in your leg and say, but my other leg matters too. Of course your other leg matters, but that's not the leg that has the gaping wound in it. Also, because of the social structure of sin, one cannot treat the body for racism without dealing with the interlocking isms, the isms of classism, sexism, etc., without also dealing with interlocking systems of education, culture, family of origin, and yes, religion. Social sin can be thought of in terms of non-local causality. There is nothing that happens to one part that is not also happening to the whole. We need to think of the global world as one system, as an interconnected whole. Jesus asks me, who is my neighbor? And that means that what happens in South Chicago has to impact me when I'm sitting in my office on the Magnificent Mile. The fact that seven people were killed and 35 people were wounded in gunshot violence in Chicago shootings over Labor Day weekend has an impact on me and it has an impact on the whole, whether I acknowledge it or not. As I was preparing this, a quick Google search turned up that on that same Labor Day weekend, there were four homicides and 114 assaults in Philadelphia. Who is my neighbor? In an interconnected global world, my neighbors are not only those in my own metropolitan area. What happens in Syria, or Myanmar happens to the whole body. The body cannot sustain itself, Paul notes, if some eat and get drunk while others are dying. If we fail to recognize the body, we eat and drink judgment on ourselves. For we have been baptized into one body. Baptism in making visible what is invisible but already real and in affecting what it signifies can cleanse us from this falsehood that we are autonomous individuals. Baptism knits us to God and to one another in and through Christ. We become one body, which is to say we become who we already are, who we are created to be. To be baptized is called to be a sacrament or a sign of unity in the world. In other words, we should be in our lives sacraments of entanglement, making visible what is invisible and allowing God to affect through us a tangible unity in the world. We are baptized into the mission of Christ, which is to incarnate God's love and God's mercy in our world. That identity and that mission that are given in our baptism 
are then affirmed and celebrated, called to mind and remembered every time we celebrate Eucharist, every time we receive communion. We celebrate who we are and whose we are. We call to mind that set of relationships, that entanglement that makes us who we are. And we celebrate God's reality of a creation in which the very particles that make up everything that exists are entangled with one another. A reality in which relationship is what's primary. That is the reign of God. And in the Eucharist, we rehearse that reign of God until we get it right. Communion is the sacrament of our entanglement. And as Augustine reminds us, we are called to be what we receive and re to receive what we are and to be what we receive. We are called to be sacraments of entanglement in the world. And so I want to leave you with just some final quotes about what it is that we do when we celebrate communion. In his sermon to the newly baptized, oh, uh, sorry, I was trying to get rid of that little thing there. Well, I'm not used to Max, so now I'm a little lost on how to get it to move back. Let's go down. There we go, thank you. Um, okay, in his sermon to the newly baptized, Augustine says, you should know what you have received, what you will receive, what you should receive daily. The bread which you see on the altar, when it has been sanctified by the word of God, is the body of Christ. If you have received it rightly, you are what you have received. For the apostle says, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. This is how he explained the sacrament of the Lord's table. Uh, again, Augustine in his Pentecost sermon to the newly baptized says, how is the bread his body and the chalice, or rather what the chalice contains, how is it his blood? Brethren, these things are called sacramenta because in them one thing is seen, but something else is understood. What is seen has a bodily appearance, but what is understood has a spiritual fruitfulness. Thus, if you wish to understand the body of Christ, listen to the apostle who says to the believers, you are the body of Christ and his members. And thus, if you are the body of Christ and his members, it is your mystery which has been placed on the altar of the Lord. You receive your own mystery. You answer amen to what you are, and in answering, you accept it. For you hear the body of Christ, and you answer amen. Be a member of Christ's body so that your amen may be true. Chicago's own Cardinal Bernadine put it another way. He said, we are called to the Lord's supper, to the Lord's table, less for solace than for strength, not so much for comfort as for service. This prayer then is prayed not only over the bread and wine so that they become Christ's body and blood for us to share. It is prayed over the entire assembly so that we may become the dying and rising Christ for the world. Participation in this great prayer of praise as meal and sacrifice transforms us. By grace, we more and more become what we pray. And in the simple words of Godfrey Diekman, what difference does it make if the bread and wine turn into the body and blood of Christ and we don't? Thank you. Sure. Comments, questions, thoughts. <laughs> Dr. Lynn. The breaks the scum on the top of the yes, pond. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
it does appear to a certain extent that um, when you take the quantum concept of entanglement, that you are sort of taking that to a more macroscopic level. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have a problem with that. Um, and I don't have a problem with it because um, my own professor of quantum mechanics used to teach that there's not really just one dividing line mm -hmm. at the Planck constant level. That what happens at the macroscopic level is that the probabilities are so overwhelmingly classical mm -hmm. that we see classical behavior. And um, what Dr. Oliver Ludwig used to teach was that in theory, it is possible for a human being to walk through a wall. If all the space in the atoms of the wall and the space in the atoms in my body lined up correctly, mm -hmm. it would be theoretically possible. Or a quantum person would say, if all the wave functions were superimposed mm -hmm. in the right way, mm -hmm. that would be theoretically possible. But the probability would be exceedingly low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't have a problem with you taking the metaphor of entanglement mm -hmm. and trying to use that to teach us something that is more in the theological and right. spiritual realm. Right. Yeah, and I guess I, I would say to that, uh, I would say to that that, again, I'm not a physicist, so I'll leave that to the physicist to, to explain um, how we understand what or if there are any actual uh, implications of that in the macro world or how we might know more about that uh, and I'd be fascinated to listen to that conversation. I try to be very careful in my language in theology to stay in the world of metaphor and analogy but you're right I do stretch it because I guess fundamentally I sort of do believe personally that if we're if if we're made of particles and the particles themselves are entangled and interconnected that there must be some implication to that. I just don't quite know scientifically what that is. I think theologically we feel and experience an interconnection. What I would not want to say is that the, the, the experience that we feel, that the, the connection we feel and experience, that that's caused by a scientific entanglement. That's what I'm trying to avoid in terms of sticking with metaphor. But I, yes, I, I think fundamentally everything that exists is interconnected. I don't know if other scientists want to comment on that and disagree with it, by all means, please feel free. Um, not that I want to disagree with it, but it seems to me that you, you can choose either to be primary mm -hmm. because you can't understand relation without events to relate. Mm -hmm. And you can't understand events without relation. So I feel that it's, it's useful to focus our attention on one or the other mm -hmm. or for a reason and to bring out the other, especially right. to mm -hmm. losing mm -hmm. it, like mm -hmm. the social sin, okay? But to actually say that one is primary is hard for me to, because they need each other, that's the mm -hmm. point. And I think it's a dialectic, you know, mm -hmm. you constantly have to go between the two, right. back and forth, back and forth. Right. Uh, I also think that, you know, if we're using Christ as a metaphor, that that his relationship in, it was very personal. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. the individual is still very important. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think you're right that I'm emphasizing the relationship and the connection because I feel like that's something that, that has been somewhat lost, particularly in a very divisive time. Um, but, but yeah, there's no relationship if there's not two objects or events or stories relating to each other. Uh, and, and certainly within the world of Catholicism, the, the individual still maintains a lot of importance. So, you know, we believe in the uniqueness of each individual person. You know, we talk, we still talk in Catholicism about the resurrection of the body and what that means and the idea that somehow this me who is, who is me exists after death. Uh, and, and maintains my uniqueness, my in some ways my individualness, while at the same time um, 
you know, I would say that part of what makes me individually me is my interconnectedness with all of the people and the relationships that I have in my life. Um, Buddhism actually has a great way of talking about this too as they talk about the no self and people oftentimes mistake the Buddhist doctrine of no self as, as saying that, um, oh well, Buddhism doesn't believe in the individual person. But what they're saying is that there's no autonomous self. There's no self that doesn't exist apart from it's relation, my relationships with everything around me. I can't exist without relationships, but yes, there's no relationship if there aren't two or more things relating. Definitely. Other thoughts, comments? Thank you very much. Um, thanks for the lecture. The first time in my life, I have the impression that I get to understand at least the, the basics of quantum physics. And, uh, I really like the idea also of putting this to work in, in, in theological interpretation. But coming from philosophy myself, I, 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 I am struggling with the relation between epistemology and ontology. <clears throat> um, I mean, how do we know that even the concept, concepts we use are in some, aren't in some way just the way in which we see the world? Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about race, um, it's, it's a dangerous term. I come from Europe for mm -hmm. the first time in my life. Here in America, I was asked which race I belong to. Yeah. And then you, I thought, well, maybe just by calling it race, mm -hmm. you make it exist. Mm. Right? And so, by, by using the term race, you already imply the existence of, of things like racism. I'm not saying the European system in which we don't ask this about each other is better because you might also say it's, it's more like you, you, you underestimate the role it plays in our implicit bias and so on. But what I mean is naming things mm -hmm. is get, giving them an existence, which, which as I understand now is, is, is also the basis of of this quantum physics. Mm -hmm. But then, how the, the way in which we understand relationships is also always related to the way in which we use concepts, mm -hmm. right? And I don't see any way of es escaping from this deadlock, right? Um, it, it might always be that what we find about the world is, is confirming our way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think according to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, you're exactly right. I mean, whatever question we're asking, we're setting up the answer that we're going to get. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, I would say when you, when you talk about something like race, uh, absolutely, race is a social construct. It's a made-up concept. Um, we made it up. But... Once we've made it up, I guess I would say it does exist. I, you know, so you know, in this day and age, we say people would say, "Well, I'm colorblind. What race do you belong to?" I belong to the human race. Except that that ignores and even suppresses the narrative of a whole people whose experience has been to be uh, prejudiced against based on this made-up construct of race. And so to to try to not talk about it, which is in some ways what I think the U.S. has done as a culture to not, you know, this was, this is actually the way I was brought up, so I'm not trying to like um, pin this out there, you know, I was brought up with this sort of um, middle, middle class white liberal mentality which says, you know, we all belong to the same race, I'm colorblind, I think all people are equal, but that doesn't actually reflect the, the reality of another person's experience who doesn't grow up, you know, who, who, who grows up experiencing systemic oppression based on this made up construct of race. So, yeah, so I think in a way we name it, we create it, but then it, it does in some ways exist. I don't know, I'm, I'm totally extrapolating now, so that's always the interesting part about the question and answers. You just start making things up as you go along. <laughs> I'll just throw one final question on the, on the table, uh, because it does seem to me that the, the challenge of something like quantum physics, where it seems to me that we understand less than what we even begin to identify, 
um, kind of forces us to say, whatever question we ask, we're going to come to another one. Mm -hmm. And with the beauty of trying to walk one's way into science and realize how much is, how much we know and how much we do not know, mm -hmm. is, is in some ways the same process of walking into theology where we, we acknowledge what we know, mm -hmm. but what we do not know. And isn't this a process of learning to ask the right question? Yeah, I guess I would say what, yeah. I think that the right question is every question that leads us to another question. Uh, because knowledge is infinite in that sense. Uh, there is no end to it, it is transcendent. Um, to go back to uh, an earlier conversation I was having today about transcendence and how do you define transcendence. Uh, you know, that idea that every time we have an answer, an answer just leads us to a new question. Uh, but I think one of the things I have also found fascinating in the science and, and religion dialogue, which you've brought up, is the concept of mystery. I think that there are some great mysteries that we can, so there's, there's an, a mystery to uh, what, you, what you could call the natural world and, and this continual discovery we have that every time we find out something, whether we're looking at the cosmos or whether we're looking at, at you know, quantum physics or the human person and what we're learning about neuroscience and the brain, we're constantly learning new things and every time we learn new things we have more questions. Um, and that's one of the beauties of human knowing. And I think that leads to a second mystery, which is the mystery of, of ourselves, of the human person. You know, we never get to a point where we come, where we can say, I know myself entirely. For one thing, I'm not done. I, I'm still living. My, I'm still having more experiences happening. I'm still having more interrelationships happening. Um, so, you know, you can't, there's always going to be more to you as a person than you can put into words and concepts. Um, and you, as a person, are always becoming more. Likewise, in theology, I mean, this is our whole concept, concept of God. God is something that can't be put into words and concepts. Every word, every concept we use to talk about God is a metaphor. It's an analogy for this mystery that is deeper and more unfathomable um, than we can ever possibly comprehend. Thank you, Ivy. Thank you. Thank you.